Okay, we are recording. Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome Frank Ferrari to Dublin virtually. Hopefully we'll get him to come here in person one of these days. Um, and he's going to tell us about gauge theory formulation by of hyperbolic gravity. And I'll pass it over to you, Frank. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. You know, even if I cannot be in Dublin, which obviously I regret very much, it's still extremely nice to be able to talk to people and, you know, the, the, this period is horrible and uh, any scientific discussions and connection are always extremely nice. So I'm going to talk about um, these uh, uh, new developments in two-dimensional quantum gravity and in particular uh, uh, on my recent work on the gauge theoretic formulation of what I call uh, two-dimensional hyperbolic gravity, which is nothing but the most general quantum gravity theory in two dimensions for which you impose the constraint that the curvature must be a, a negative constant, okay? And the most general case of this involves different possible boundary conditions that you can put when uh, your two-dimensional manifold on which the theory is uh, defined uh, um, so you see, there are several different types of boundary conditions that are consistent, and this yields the most general, let's say, setup uh, that you can get. So eventually we will get to that point. But before, uh, I want to spend a lot of time, I think, on uh, an introduction, just so that you understand also my motivation, the big questions, uh, what are the big questions, why I got interested in this problem, and also this is just, you know, my paper in November is just one step forward in a direction that I want to explain. All right. So two-dimensional quantum gravity, of course, it's, it's, it's a very old subject. It's a, a fascinating subject. It has connections with many areas of physics. Uh, and mathematics, you know, from string theory to uh, uh, matrix models, run, random matrices, uh, and more recently holography, uh, but also pure mathematics, you know, like uh, intersection theory on the modelized space of Riemann surfaces, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fascinating subject. The I think from the point of view of physics, we, we are studying this because we hope that we can learn some lessons about quantum gravity in higher dimensions from this very simple toy two-dimensional case. And uh, I, I can tell you that my personal point of view was that this was a bit fake, uh, that you know, two dimensions is, is so special that the real motivation to do it is that we can actually solve some models and, and that also is very elegant and nice, so we have fun doing it. But the most recent developments, I think, suggest that it can go a long way. And, and, and you know, in particular, the fact that it contains black holes and that we can actually discuss very deep and non-trivial aspects of black holes within this setup uh, tells you that it's actually maybe more interesting, actually, than what, at least personally, I thought. It, it, it's more than a mathematical toy uh, I think it, it has very interesting physics indeed. So a few highlights in this two-dimensional world. Of course, you have the Liouville quantum gravity with this uh, uh, well-known action here. This governs in some sense, the most general two-dimensional quantum gravity theories coupled to conformal matter. Um, another highlight is that by using a matrix model formulation of the Liouville quantum gravity, you can derive non-perturbative equations like these famous Pan-Levé equations for the partition functions. So it's, it's a model where you can derive some non-perturbative aspects. And actually this is the way D-brains in some sense were first discovered or at least non-perturbative effects that have the correct weight to be interpreted as, as D-brain effects were discovered. So that's very nice. And then there's also the pure mathematical story with the name of Witten and Konsevich at attached to it. This famous Eri matrix, cubic matrix models that describe the moduli space, the, some intersection numbers on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. More recent developments. Let me just mention a couple of more recent developments in this standard story. 
First of all, the mathematicians have been able really to put this setup in, in some very rigorous framework based on probability theory. And there's, a, for example, a very nice paper by Duplantier and Sheffield along these lines. And essentially, it's doing the mathematics of a free field, but doing it in an extremely precise way and deriving KPZ, for example, in a mathematical way. So this part of the story is no really pure, I mean, genuine mathematics. It can, it can be made really precise. And let me also mention a series of work I did now a while ago with uh, Steve Zeldich and Simeon Kletsov and also Adel Bilal on generalizing the Liouville story when you couple to non-conformal quantum field theory. So you couple 2D gravity to non-conformal quantum field theory. And the surprise and the interesting aspects here were that we discovered that the correction to Liouville is governed by another remarkable geometric action called the Mabushchi action in the mathematical literature that has a lot of very nice geometrical properties. So this yield interesting generalizations of Liouville quantum gravity too. Okay. So th this is okay, the normal way we look at two-dimensional quantum gravity. Now, let me emphasize that in this story, you really have, let's say, two classes of models. The first class is the most general class, which, uh, I would, which is Liouville, which is you know, what the physicists do. I mean, you just do most general 2D gravity, you couple it to some quantum field theory. It's, in principle, extremely hard. Uh, you go to conformal gauge, Typically in this game, and sigma is this Liouville field I was mentioning in the previous transparency. And then what you want to compute is an integral over metrics. So the set of metrics, the space of metrics on some two dimensional surface, modulo the group of diffeomorphisms. That's what you want to compute. And by going to conformal gauge, you separate this calculation typically into two pieces. One is an integral over conformal factors of metrics. So this sigma is, is a scalar field, if you like, so some smooth map from sigma to R, and an additional integral over mod the moduli space of complex structures of sigma, which is also the moduli space of conformal classes of metrics on a Riemann surface. This is a finite dimensional integral. This measure is very nice. It's called the weil peterson measure. So this is, in some sense, the math part. It's sort of easy because it's finite dimensional, but there is some deep and, and non-trivial and nice mathematics underlying this piece. And maybe the physics is here. So here, even if you take the theory on the sphere where you don't have any topological uh, non-trivial information and where you don't have this integral, you still have some highly non-trivial, you know, metric fluctuations governed by this UV field that you have to compute. This. Okay, so that's the most general story. Now there's a second story, which is the so-called topological. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Where, why is there no uh, Jacobian in the transformation in the first well, line? You have. So of course, to go from it, that's a very good point. To go from here to there, there's a lot of work to do. So you have to compute all those Jacobians. Those Jacobians are taken into account if you do the very careful analysis in what are actually these measures here and there, which I did not explain. So I just said, this is the vile peterson measure. The fact that it's the vile peterson measure on, on this moduli space of complex structures is a highly non-trivial statement that comes from precise evaluation of the measure factors or the Jacobians, starting from some ultra-local standard, you know, like the Witt metric on the space of metrics on, on sigma, etc. So yes, so there is a story here about Jacobians, etc. You have to deal with that. But there are infinite number of prime manifolds in 2D. Sorry? Uh, for example, I mean, you say the moduli space is finite dimension. Yes. I would have thought because in a plane, you can attach handles. So there are infinite number of prime manifolds. So there should be an infinite number of this uh, moduli space. OK, um, yes. So it's, you know, if you fix the topology of, of your surface sigma, it's finite dimensional. Then oh. what you say, you want to sum maybe over topologies. So that's an, an additional sum over all the genera, for example, mm -hmm. and all the possible number of boundaries. So then in that case, yes, 
you get this infinite additional sum. Here, I, uh, I'm assuming that I work uh, on the fixed topology. At least that's the first step, if you like. Then you might want to sum over the topology. So the moduli space is over what? Are over complex structures or yes. what? Yeah, okay. Yes. Moduli space of complex structures. Well, physically, you need to, what you do is really moduli space of conformal factors, of conformal classes of metrics. But in two dimensions, it's the same as the moduli space of complex structures. You know? All right. So, okay. So the second type of models that people have been studying, this topological, I call them math. So math is easy, right? <laughs> If, if, if it can be done very precisely already, it means that in some sense it's easy, even though this mass might be extremely high level and difficult to understand. But anyway, so the topological story amounts to integrate over metrics for which the curvature is negative and constant. Okay, so this is a very strong restriction on the full space of metrics. Now, this is the same, and we will review that later, as integrating over flat PSL2R connections defined on sigma. From the un standard uni uniformization theorem, you know that this is equivalent just to integrate over the moduli space of complex structures, because for each complex structures, you have a unique uh, uh, R equal minus two metric on the Riemann surface. And so, this story essentially keeps only this piece. You know, you just have that. You no longer have the integral of a conformal factors because you have this constraint r equal minus two. And from the point of view of the PSL2R flat connections, this moduli space of complex structures is replaced essentially by the group morphisms from the first homotopy group of sigma to PSL2R. Uh, modulo conjugation. Physically, it means that because you have flat connections, the only degrees of freedom are the holonomies. And these holonomies precisely are really morphisms from the homotopy group to PSL2R. And of course, the base point doesn't play a role, so it's modulo conjugation. This moduli space of morphisms is actually the same. You have, an iso you have a diffeomorphism with the moduli space of complex structures. And of course, those two pictures yields the same result. It's nice to check, it's non-trivial to check, but it does yield the same result. And eventually you have so to compute integrals uh, over the moduli space with the Weil Peterson measure. These are two completely different uh, stories. So more difficult because of this and mathematical here, right? There's a nice generalization of the usual Sorry. So Frank, what happens to the integral over uh, the vial factor? Are you saying you don't? So here, when in the standard setup, I will refine the statements I'm making now, but in the standard setup of this topological story, there's only, if you like, one sigma for each complex structure on the surface you're considering that has r equal minus two. So yes. for this reason, this integral disappears. But, but, they, but they can't then be equivalent. Sorry? They, the two are not completely equivalent then. There's this. The mass is this plus the insertion, if you like, of a delta function that imposes r equal minus two. Okay, oh, fine. Here, you don't impose r equal minus two. You want to integrate over all metrics. And the, the, the curvature, the scalar curvature can be anything, okay? So this is a very strong additional constraint that you put. Uh, so it's no longer the genuine quantum gravity where you would like to integrate over all metrics. You just restrict yourself to a subclass of metrics, which in this setup is very small. It's finite dimensional space. So That's for, physics, That's you know, okay. for physics, there are two different the theories then. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Is P S L two, S L two Z Z no coefficients in Z. Two R. So R. It is Z two or R? Okay. R R. R okay. Uh, why is it R? Well, anyway, let us see. 
So it is Z2, no? Or Sorry? P PSL2 or R. What is PSL2? PSL2? R. So, you know, it's, it's the set of two by two matrices with real entries, determinant one, and modulo indeed Z2, modulo okay. sign. I want know that. Is it Z2? Modulo Z2. No, yeah. it is abelian, no? PSL2 R is. I'm not. Uh, so PSL2 R, I can, you know, of course. SU11, no? I'll come back on that. Sorry? It is SU11, PSU11, no? Uh, I'm not, I don't remember this other terminology, but this is just, you know, A, B, C, D. I understand. Okay. You know, what is the, what A, is B the, minus oh. B, C equal one modulo sign. That's it. That's what PSL 2R is. I was wondering what was the fundamental group or that uh, two dimensional group. Okay. Ah, yeah, I, that's U1. That is U1, okay. Yeah, because PSL2R, so I will. Yes, I understand. Will, yes. But it's the same, actually, maybe it's, it's easier to see it in this way. It's the same as the two plus one dimensional proper orthochronous Lorentz group. So it's SO2,1 plus. So, you know, the Lorentz transformations of determinant one, which are orthochronous. I understand. So okay. it is SO2. So it is the same as SU11 or PSU. Probably it is the same. Yeah. yeah. And that is contractible to U1. So. Right. So there's, because there's a U1, just the rotations. Yeah. Okay. All right. Absolutely. So that's important, actually, that it's contractible into U1. We'll see why later, even though I'm not going to enter into this uh, um, subtle, detailed subtleties, but it's important. Uh, all right. So what is the generalization? Um, you can consider surfaces where you have boundaries that are geodesics. And now the geodesics have some length. So you can compute this generalized guy here where you integrate the vile Peterson volume over the moduli space of surfaces that have geodesics boundaries of fixed length L1, L2 up to LB. Is B is the number of circle boundaries. This is a very nice object to consider, the so-called generalized vile Peterson volumes. And these are the objects that Mirzahani famously considered and computed. And in particular, these guys are, turn out to be polynomials in the length, and you can compute this. This is very nice. This is very beautiful. The calculations are non-trivial for one reason, really. There, there is one extremely subtle point that make the whole story really hard. And that, that's why this, this was enough to get the field's middle. It's because, of course, since this is a gravity path integral, you divide by the diffeomorphism group. On this moduli space, it means that you have to divide over the mapping class group, so the large diffeomorphisms. But dividing by the mapping class group does not commute with using a pair of pants decomposition of your surfaces. In other words, this sort of calculations cannot be sort of decomposed in very simple building blocks based on the fact that your Riemann surface can be built by, you know, gluing together these pants like pieces. When you can do that, you have some sort of standard, a standard procedure to actually compute. And, and this was used for topological ordinary topological gauge theories. However, in the gravity setup, because you have to divide by the mapping class group that does not commute with, with a decomposition like this, the wall calculation is much harder, much, much harder. And, and so, you know, the way to do it is, is explained here. All right, so this is the topological story. Now, what about the Jackie title bond, these new things? Well, the, the action was written long ago, but it's only recently that we really understood what it means and why it's useful. Jackie title point, you, I think you can see it as lying in between topological and uveal. First of all, you still impose the constraint r equal minus two. So it's like topological. You say, oh, that's too easy. I mean, 
you, you put this very strong constraint. However, you relax the boundary condition that the boundaries should be geodesics. You relax that condition, you replace it by something else that allows for more general metrics. And the resulting model, even though it has r equal minus two, also has an infinite dimensional space of metrics over which one must integrate. And we will describe that a little bit more later. So the standard picture of the surfaces you need to integrate is like this. So you know you have a Riemann surface with uh, some holes, and you also have boundaries. But now the boundaries are not nice geodesics. They, they can have wiggles. And you need to integrate over those wiggles. Of course, I have to define what wiggles are, and I will do it later. But you have to integrate over those wiggles, and this is an infinite dimensional space. In other words, in these Jacky Teitelbaum models, there is an integral to do here. It's not arbitrary sigmas because the sigmas must correspond to R equal minus two matrix, but the sigmas encode non-trivial wiggles of the boundaries. So there is an infinite dimensional integral to do here. It's simpler than Liouville, but it exists. And it's so much harder than just Weil Peterson. Okay. So that's what JT gravity is. And eventually the model is actually already extremely non-trivial, even when you formulate it on the disk. So on the disk, if you remember, you have, okay, in general, not only on the disk, you have the Gauss-Bonnet formula that relates, if you like, the area of the surface. So because R equal minus two, this piece is always given by minus the area. So you have a relation between minus the area the integral of the extrinsic curvature on the boundary on the Euler number of the surface. If you impose that the boundary is a geodesics, this is zero. And clearly the models exist only when B plus two G is, uh, is strictly greater than two. So you don't have a model on the disk. You don't have a, a geodesic boundary, a disk with a geodesic boundary when R equal minus two, that doesn't exist. However, uh, if uh, the boundary is not a geodesics, then it can work perfectly well, including uh, uh, for a disk. And then uh, the only thing is that you have a relation between the area and the integral of the extrinsic curvature, which can now be some non-trivial function here of the geometry. Good. Okay. So a bit more details about Jackie Teitelboim in the standard second order gravitational formulation. So that's the action. So you have a term which simply is uh, included in order to impose the R equal minus two constraint. So this phi, which is called the dilaton is nothing but a Lagrange multiplier. Okay, you integrate over phi, that will impose R equal minus two plus some Jacobian factors. Okay, but essentially that, that will impose R equal minus two. And then in order to make the uh, variational principle consistent, you had this uh, uh, boundary term uh, um, with the extrinsic curvature. Sometimes you add other constant terms that will not be really relevant for my talk today. And the Jacquive title bond boundary conditions is just as follows. This Lagrange multiplier field is fixed to a constant on the boundaries and the length of the boundaries are also fixed to constants. So the JT partition function is just a function of pairs of number phi and L, one pair per component of the boundary, phi and L. On the disk, you just have one boundary. So it's just, just a function of phi and L. And that's a type of object that you would like to understand and compute. Note that there's a nice classical limit. For example, on the disk, the classical limit is L fixed, but phi goes to infinity. The classical solution is just given by a disk that is embedded in the hyperbolic space H2. So here is the standard metric in, uh, in the disk presentation of hyperbolic space. And uh, uh, because um, we impose the length of the boundary to be fixed. That just tells you that the uh, uh, metric that is the solution of the JT gravity in the classical limit uh, 
is just a disk with this radius that is related to L. And so you can compute everything. And also you can compute the profile of the dilaton field, which is just this. It's, it's a moment map for the action of rotations in the hyperbolic plane. The LCI is the length of the boundary, am I right? L of CI is the length of the boundary, right. Ah, so that involves a metric, which is presumably the pullback metric. Right, absolutely. Okay. So, but you're in the last equation, you are integrating over all the metrics. So is this LCI, it's also so, getting, oh, I see. It is no, also it's, getting it's, integrated. Hmm? It's part of the boundary conditions. Ah, so I'm integrating over all the metrics that have R equal minus two, and the length of the boundaries are also fixed. But in this integration, one is assuming that even when you integrate, the length is computed by the, at each, for each G, it is computed by the pullback metric. Absolutely. Okay. Good. So there's a classical limit, and this classical limit means in principle that you might be able to develop a perturbation theory and one compute one loop to loops, etc. So in principle, it should be well defined. Nobody has set this up. And that's part of the work I'm doing now, because it's actually much harder than what it looks to do this perturbation theory at fixed L. But in principle, this should be well defined. At least there is a classical solution. There is a, a classical version. Another limit that people have studied a lot is the so-called infinite cutoff limit, which uh, is also named as the Schwarzschild limit. In this limit, you take phi goes to infinity, but also L to infinity at the same time. The ratio L over phi being fixed, and I call it beta, okay? So that's a limit, if you like, where your disk is, got, is becoming extremely large. And if you want to see it as embedded, into the hyperbolic plane, it's almost the whole hyperbolic plane, but not completely, at least when L is fixed, but when L goes to infinity eventually, you know, it's like you remove the cutoff in some holographic picture of the model. So in that limit, you have a truly remarkable, I don't know how to call it, conjecture or statement or more or less derived thing, which is this equation. The statement is as follows. In that limit, the integral over phi and g reduces to an integral over diffeomorphisms of the circle divided by PSL to R. So this integral is only over this sort of functions, so diffeomorphisms, so it's just functions of one variable that are diffeomorphisms, modulo PSL to R with an action, which is the Schwarzschild derivative essentially of this diffeomorphism. To be very precise, I wrote it here. So that's what the action is. It's the Schwarzschild derivative of the tangent of f over two with respect to the circle variable that I call here theta. So this equality is highly non-trivial statement. Then there's another equality which is actually much easier. Well, compared to that, that's much easier, which tells you that this integral can be computed exactly and that this is the exact result with some undetermined global normalization factor C, but otherwise all the beta dependence is completely fixed. All right, so what is this? So this, this homogeneous manifold here, this cushion, that's a well-known, well-studied infinite dimensional symplectic manifold. What is the plus, plus? What is that plus? Uh, that plus means orientation preserving. Okay. Okay. So, okay. It's a trivial factor of two, if you want. That's, no, plus means, yeah. So F prime is positive for me. Okay. Could I uh, ask a quick question about the, the reason that's integrable? Is it, uh, is it some kind of Deutschmann Heckman localization mechanism Absolutely. that does that? Absolutely. Okay, I thank will, you. I will go to that in the next transcript, yeah. but that's, that's the reason. So indeed, yeah. this is, if you like, this is the classical action. So if you evaluate the action on that solution in the Schwarzschild limit, 
you will get this number. So that's just the classical piece. And this is the one loop determinant. And then the statement is that there's no corrections. And that's indeed a statement of Duistermatt Ekman uh, that I will quickly explain later. Right. So, okay, this manifold is well known. Why is it symplectic? There are many ways to understand that, but it's very natural from many different points of view. One point of view that people know and use a lot is the fact that this can be seen as a particular coadjoint orbit of the Virazoro group. And so you know that you know, coadjoint orbits of, uh, of uh, groups uh, always ha uh, have very natural symplectic structures given by this uh, Kirillov constant Suryo construction. So that's one way to understand that it is, but I could also write down explicit formulas for the symplectic form. There's nothing really uh, um, deep or surprising here. Now, one highly non-trivial statement in this equality, one among several, is that the measure here is the Liouville measure on this symplectic manifold. Okay, just the Liouville measure associated with the natural uh, uh, Kirillov constant Suryo symplectic form. That's highly non-trivial. Okay. What happens to the central term of the uh, Virazoro group in the quotient? Sorry? The central term of the Virazoro group in the, what happens to it? The D plus, D plus S1 has a canonical human extension. So I there's a central term. Uh, uh, I didn't understand your question, sorry. Virazoro algebra has this uh, C, the central term, and that uh, you said, uh, in Virazoro, you mean? Where is the central? You said that the you said that this is uh, like the uh, coadjoint orbit of the Virasuru group. You could, yeah, that's one way to realize that quotient. But the Virasuru group is not diffuse one; it is also a central term. Sure. What happens to it in the quotient? But this is not the quotient of the Virasuru. You know, so this space is an orbit of the Virazoro group acting on, on um, linear forms in the Lie algebra of Virazoro. I understand. So what happens to the central term in the action? Or the so I think the central term in the action in the Virazoro is important for the group multiplication. So it tells you how the coadjoint action works. And, you know, and then this is by looking into this that, that you actually, ah, you mean, do you have a dependence in C? Yeah, I mean, how does it act? Okay. Because this is not the quotient of the Virasuru group with some- uh, It's not the quotient of the Virasuru group. I joined, yeah. Ah, sorry, this diff has nothing to do with, so Virasuru, of course, is a central extension of diff of S1, but this is not what I mean here. So may, maybe this comment was confusing, okay? So okay. there's the Virasoro group, then you have coadjoint orbits of the Virasoro group, and one of these coadjoint orbits is actually that guy. Okay. Okay? And that guy then has a symplectic structure because for all groups, essentially when you have, when you look at the coadjoint, a coadjoint orbit, it's always a symplectic manifold. Forget about this, okay, just, all I wanted to say is that there's a natural symplectic form on that space, and this integral uh, measure here is the Liouville measure associated with this symplectic form, all right? Okay. Now, this Schwarzian action turns out to be the moment map associated just with the trivial action of, of diffeomorphism, just rotations, if you like, of the, of theta, theta goes, to theta plus constant. So this is of course um, a symplectomorphism, if you like, it's a symmetry of the problem and you, uh, and you have a moment map associated with it. And then it's a completely straightforward calculation to compute the moment map if you know the symplectic form. And it turns out the result of the calculation is that this moment map is just this Schwarzian action. That's why this guy is exactly what you need to use Dwistermat Ekman. It's just the integral over a symplectic manifold with the Liouville measure, e to the minus the moment map 
of some circle action, which is just this. And that's why this is exact, okay? So from here to there is some sort of standard. It was essentially known, I think, in the mathematical literature, except that, of course, it's an infinite dimensional version of the systematic land. So I'm not saying that it's completely rigorous, but at the level of theoretical physics, it's completely okay. That's how it works. This is much harder to understand as we discuss now. So why is all this so interesting? And what are the basic puzzles? Why is it interesting to think about this uh, now in spite of all the work that has already been done? And so let me list some fundamental puzzles, known and less known. Known basic puzzle, this formula for the partition function on the disk can be rewritten like this with this density. This is not consistent with a standard quantum mechanical interpretation of the theory. The standard quantum mechanical interpretation would have liked to say that this model should be dual holographically to some quantum mechanics that live on the boundary. So some finite temperature, if you like quantum mechanical system living on the boundary and the temperature would be one over beta. However, this cannot work because for such quantum systems, the density should be a sum of delta functions. You always have a discrete spectrum. So it should be something much, much more complicated than this. So there's no way this is going to be given by a stand, uh, mecha quantum mechanical thing. In other words, maybe I should put it here. This is different. This can never be written as the trace over some Hilbert space of e to the minus beta h for some well-defined h. There's no formula like this. Huh. So this is subtle, right? So let me just emphasize a, a, a confusing point. The reason why the spectrum should be discrete is because here we claim that we have done the quantum gravity path integral in an exact way. So the Newton's constant is fixed here. In other words, there's no large n limit or you know, semi-classical limit or anything like that involved in this calculation. It is supposed to be the exact quantum gravity result. And then the spectrum should be discrete. And that's not what you find. So even though the claim is we have an exact quantum gravity result, the answer is is, is disappointing in some sense because it, it doesn't look like it's quantum mechanical. And there's no holography here, if this is true. Second puzzle, which is also well known and related to the first. If you start to compute with, for example, two boundaries, then you have Z that depends on beta one and beta two. There will be contributions given, of course, by two disconnected disks. But you also have contributions coming from geometries of that kind, which are Euclidean wormholes. So at the end of the day, this guy is not the product Z of beta one, Z of beta two. This is again crazy in quantum mechanics because what, what is this in quantum mechanics if it's not just the product? It sort of implies that what you're computing when you include these Euclidean wormholes is some sort of average of product of partition functions. In other words, it looks like you're doing an average over theories. So this JT quantum gravity might be actually not a quantum theory, but an ensemble of quantum theory. And this interpretation was put forward by Saad, Schenker, and Stanford, and then many others after, uh, after, the, after SSS. That might be, you, you might think it's in line with SYK models, which are disordered models. They also have tensor or matrix model versions, which are not disordered, but the disordered version are also ensemble of quantum theories. But it's a bit disappointing from the point of view of quantum gravity. And it's both disappointing because that's not really quantum mechanics. It might also be seen as extremely exciting because it's new, it's, we didn't expect that, so there is something maybe that we are learning here. Now, other puzzles. Maybe it's, these are my puzzles. 
and, and these are the things I did not understand at all when I started this project that I know I understand partially. I didn't, I don't, still don't understand everything. But I think these are interesting questions and maybe I'll have your feedback on that. And uh, it, the most interesting would be if it, if it tells you something about the previous puzzles I've just mentioned. So let's, let's have a look at this formula. And this is based on, on many steps. And, and these steps are, um, are bad. So. so the first step, maybe that's the most important of all, is that the, 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 to do that, you start from the following picture. You describe the r equal minus two matrix on the disk by considering particular embeddings of the disk in hyperbolic space. And then you say the, the metrics are just the pullbacks of this obtained by these embeddings. And these particular embeddings are obtained by, re, by so-called reparameterizations. What do, what do I mean by that? So, okay, this is my hyperbolic space with the usual metric. I consider here a curve, non-intersecting, which is given by a reparametrization. So it's not any curve. It's a curve such that phi of s, so phi is the angular variable here in this plane, in this disk. And phi of s, where s is the length along gamma, I claim is given by f of theta, okay, where theta is just an angular variable, so two pi s over l, where l is the length of the boundary, but then f is a diffeomorphism. So f prime positive, and of course it's a diffeomorphism, so it has that, okay? So I, from scratch, declare that I'm going to consider the metrics that are parametrized by a diffeomorphism. And so this is the picture, you know, any geometry of this sort is indeed given parametrized by that, okay? So this gives you by pullback on the disk, a metric associated to each particular shape that you have here. And the shape is parameterized by diffeomorphism. Of course, if you act with the isometry group of the hyperbolic plane, you're not going to change the pullback metric. That's why you obtain an integral over diff of S1 over PSL2R. Here, the PSL2R comes from the isometries of the hyperbolic plane on which you embed your disks. Okay, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? I'll come back on that. But first, let me point. Sorry, Frank, can I, can I just ask one question? Why would one exclude non-differentiable uh, curves? Ooh, okay. I would have expected maybe that so, one might need to include them. You're right. You don't know what kind of precise mathematical conditions to impose. I will work within smooth, the space of smooth metrics. Okay? That's an assumption. But you'll sure. see that even within that most, let's say, simple assumption, this is still a big puzzle. Why you restrict to that? No, no, I appreciate that. Okay, so that's the first step. The second step is that you assume then that this integral reduces to the integral over the Uville measure in the Schwarzian limit. Nobody has computed that Jacobian, if you like, to derive that. Certainly that's natural, but why is that true? You've got to compute the Jacobian. And computing the Jacobian starting from the second order gravitational formulation is an impossible task. I tried, it's, it's horribly complicated. And one of the motivation to develop a gauge theory formulation is that in the gauge theory, PSL2 formulation, it's going to be much more tractable, this um, step here. But that's a non-trivial thing. Third, 
then write that the action, which is essentially the integral over the extrinsic curvature is the Schwarzschild action. That's simple. That's a very simple calculation. In the Schwarzschild limit, on this sort of configurations, you just compute and you get that. That's trivial. And then compute that. That's also sort of trivial. If you understand Duisterman Ekman, that's just Duisterman Ekman. Okay, so those two steps are easy. This is the really bizarre step. This is a non-trivial step that I think can be done, but has not been done in the literature. These two steps are easy. This is trivial and this is easy if you understand localization. Okay, so let, let's come back to this first. The most general metric with R equal minus two on the disk certainly is not given by embeddings of this type. For example, you could consider embeddings of that type here with turning points. You know, phi of s here has turning points. So phi of s is not going to be given by your diffeomorphism anymore. You know, the derivative can be zero. And this, of course, is a very nice embedding. If you pull it back to the, to the disk, you get a, met a, a, a metric that you have to include in your path integral. The Schwarzschild action for this sort of configuration will be infinite because in the Schwarzschild you have denominators that are proportional to the first derivative of, of this diffeomorphism, which is no longer diffeomorphism. Okay, at the turning points, you have singularities. So this is not described by a Schwarzschild. Okay, this action on these configurations will not reduce to the Schwarzschild action. But people have just discarded this completely. So if you understand that, you could say, okay, maybe there's an exact description still that we might develop in terms of Jordan, I mean, non-intersecting curves at finite cut of L. So the, they have a finite length L embedded in a hyperbolic plane. And this point of view has been sort of developed, put forward at finite L by these people in these two papers. So they insist that we should consider non-intersecting curves. And, but for some reason, they never really say that in the Schwarzschild limit, these guys are a problem with respect to the Schwarzschild, etc. They don't really discuss that. But they, they, you, can, you, know, you have a few lines where they say, okay, the non-perturbative theory should be dealing with non-intersecting boundaries like that. They don't, they don't address whether this should disappear at infinite cutoff or, or, or not. But I don't care because this statement is also completely wrong. So the, the, the first claim that you should consider non-intersecting curves is completely wrong. And the second that they disappear in the Schwarzschild limit, I don't know if it's wrong, but it's probably wrong. So what is the most general R equal minus two metric on a disk? They're given so fortunately, the mathematicians have studied this. And they're given not by embeddings, but by, Im by immersions of the disk in hyperbolic plane. Immersions. So locally, they look like embeddings. But globally, they're not one to one. And here I give you an example. So this is the boundary of my immersed disk. And you see this boundary indeed those bound the disk, except that there's a piece here that I have stretched in order that it goes on top of another piece. So, you know, it's like a, a, a crept, maybe that, you know, we've <laughs> stretched and then we put it uh, on top here. Okay, so here uh, uh, you have the same point on the hyperbolic disk correspond to actually two distinct points on the disk we started from. But of course, if you have a geometry like this, if you pull it back, it gives you a perfectly well-defined metric on the disk. So this is the, the precise statement. If you go to the conformal gauge, which you can always do, what you have to consider are general holomorphic immersions. So holomorphic functions defined on the disk with value in H2. So they are such that F prime is different from zero. That's why they define immersions. F must be strictly less than one for all Z in the disk because you must uh, be, you must immerse your disk within 
the hyperbolic plane. And the pulled back metric is just this guy. Okay, so ju that, that's just the normal metric on H2 of the hyperbolic plane pulled back by this holomorphic function F. This is the most general, you can show that this is the most general R equal minus two metric on a disk. You, you still have to divide by the PSL2R groups of automorphisms, of course, of the disk, and of course, also of, of isometries, but that's a trivial piece in the discussion. But this is the discussion. So you see that curves can intersect. The, the boundary in H2 can intersect. There's no self-avoiding loops in this, in this game at all. Now, let me emphasize something I think that could have consequences, is that it is easy, it's an easy exercise to do, to build configurations of this type that have a finite action even when you take the Schwarzian limit. I call that UV microstructures. How do you do that? Imagine you have a smooth piece like this given by some reparametrization. Then locally, you can always, you know, modify it by a little piece like that. Or even worse, a piece like that. You immerse, you introduce uh, um, uh, intersection, intersection points in the curve. You can always do that clearly without changing much the area enclosed by the curve and the area is the action. So adding all these microstructures does not make your action very large. And you can do that again for any cutoff, for arbitrary high cutoff. My conclusion is that for the moment, I still do not understand at all why this UV microstructures that you can have with these very nasty configurations would not play a role, including in the Schwarzian limit. At finite L, there's no question. They play a role. You have to send over all these guys. That's for sure. The, the question I cannot answer with certainty is whether you have to keep them in the Schwarzian limit. But since they have finite action in this limit. It's hard to understand why you should discard them. So maybe, you know, the usual Schwarzian action, which is one loop exact, is simply some sort of averaged version for which this UV structure is neglected. And that might be the reason why we get something that is not quantum mechanical and so simple. Maybe. Okay, so I think that's an interesting, at least, thing to point out. Now, this being said, the construction of a genuine non-perturbative theory along these lines is very challenging. These guys are actually very nasty and they're worse than what you might think from what I've said up to now. Let me point out two features. First of all, not all curves that you might draw in the hyperbolic plane bound an immersed disk. For example, it's not difficult to convince yourself that this figure eight does not bound any immersed disk. So it's not that we're doing a path integral over all path in H2. It's not also that we're doing over path that do not intersect. Some paths that intersect have to be included, but not all of them. Which have to be included is a non-trivial combinatorial problem, which beautiful, was beautifully solved by mathematicians in the late 60s, by Samuel Blanc and Valentin Pouirani. Okay, and, and if you want to have a look, you have a Bourbaki seminar on that problem from 67. It's a very beautiful combinatorial solution. And you have also a very nice review, much more recent, by Graver and Cargo that you might want to look. It's beautiful. Second point, even more mind blowing, at least in my opinion. A given curve, so you pick a given boundary here, take one. A given boundary might bound two distinct 
immersed disks. So the same boundary, you might interpret it as being the boundary of actually two distinct disks. That's amazing. And in this review, you have an example. You know, if you like this sort of thing, look at it. Uh, it's extremely nice, extremely beautiful. So that means that knowing the curve, knowing the boundary, doesn't actually determine the metric uniquely. Because you might have two immersed, distinct immersed disks associated with it. So two different pullbacks associated with the same curve. Can well, I ask you a question? Sure. Um, you couldn't draw that example, could you? Ah, you know what? In the, in the question session, I will share you the picture. Okay. I have it somewhere. I can do that. Okay. okay. So Thanks. ask again in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, all right. Good. So I realize that uh, it's almost over. How, how, how long? We, we are not under pressure. I mean, we. So I can keep, you know, I'm I going to keep, keep going. going. Tell me how, how long you, you, you're okay with it. Is 15 minutes a problem? I or think, okay, 15 minutes. I think I can. 20 minutes. At least I can talk about the geisha reconstruction. Sure, yeah. They, they, don't rush. That's not, it's not. Okay. All right. So now you have the big picture and all my motivation. What, what do I want to understand? And as a first step in, in you know, getting a deeper understanding of all these things, I believe that an important step was to formulate the uh, gravitational model in terms of this PSL2R gauge theory. Because clearly constant curvature metrics are most naturally and most beautifully described in that setup. So, it's, it's, it's not only a calculational tool, it's also a conceptual tool. So I think, you know, to address all these questions, you're better equipped if you have a gauge theory formulation. So let me recall the basics. The step one in the basics is of course, to have in mind the first order formulation of gravity. So you just replace the metric by these um, uh, local frames, EA mu. The metric is related to the local frames in this way, as usual. And in this description, you enhance the gauge group, which is the diffeomorphisms to diffeomorphisms times U1 hat. So hat means it's the gauge group based on the U1. This U1 hat is just, of course, the, the, the gauge group associated with local rotations. And in two dimensions, these are just, this is just an abelian group. So it's just S, local SO2 SO equal mu one. So that's the first order formulation. And you can do that. Now, the beautiful thing about constant curvature metric is as follows. Introduce a PSL to our gauge field, A, which I expand over a basis of generators of the Lie algebra of PSL to R, satisfying this uh, standard algebra, okay? So you could, I told you that PSL to R is also SO21 plus. So it's the Lorentz group. So J is the rotation generator and K1 and K2 are boost generators. You can uh, have this in mind. So you do that. And then you do the exercise of computing the field strength, the curvature for this connection. So dA plus A squared. And a simple calculation gives you this very nice formula. In front of J, you have D omega plus capital omega. Capital omega is just E1 wedge E2. And in front of the boost generators, you get the, this one, these two forms, TAs, given by this formula. Now, clearly, if you assume that uh, your configuration is such that this capital omega is different from zero, okay, so you have this assumption of non-degeneracy, then you immediately get a gravitational interpretation. With this constraint, these EAs, can be interpreted as local frames. This will then be the volume form. These guys are nothing but the torsion two forms associated with the spin connection omega. And so the flatness condition is equivalent to TA equal to zero. It tells you that your connection is actually Levi Civita. And the vanishing of the coefficient in front of the rotation generator give you that d omega 
So the exterior derivative of the spin connection, which is directly related to the curvature, is minus the volume form. And you can check very easily that this is equivalent to, the, to imposing that the Ricci scalar is a constant equal to minus two. So flat connections, flat PSL2R connections are in this very nice way, naturally related to R equal minus two matrix. Good. So this is what I brought here. Moreover, if you introduce the following action, just the integral of trace of BF where B is some adjoint uh, Lagrange multiplier scalar field, you can check that this is the correct JT gravity equations of motion. So if B is expanding in, expanding in that way on the Lie algebra generators, this is the dilaton uh, Lagrange multiplier in the JT formulation. These are new uh, uh, vector fields, which on shell are just given by this formula and must be killing vectors. So this formula tells you since chi is a killing vector, it tells you that phi is a moment map associated with the killing vectors. And, and that's what essentially I mentioned briefly before. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence also at the level of the local equations of motion. Naively, the gauge symmetries also match. Uh, so if, if sigma, if your surface doesn't have boundaries, they actually do match. Uh, the local frame rotations is the U1 including in PSL2R. And the diffeomorphisms and PSL2R transformations coincide on shell. This is a calculation you have to make, okay? You, you know how all your variables transform and you have to check that it works, but it beautifully works. It's the same thing as what happens in three dimensions when you do the chen simons formulations on three-dimensional gravity. It's essentially a, a two-dimensional version of these beautiful results in three dimensions. It's a, very similar. It works very well. So that's OK. There's no subtlety when you don't have boundaries. But in the presence of boundaries, you have crucial subtleties. And that's why people couldn't really formulate the, 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 the thing correctly. And that's essentially what I did in November. So why do you have a problem when you have a boundary? That's very easy to understand. Take just the case of the disk. Clearly, the disk is simply connected. So flat connections on the disk are just trivial. You can always gauge them away to zero. So a standard gauge theory on the disk doesn't have any degree of freedom. How can that be the same as JT gravity? We have just explained that already on the disk, it's extremely subtle. And you have all these uh, immersions that you have to consider. So that can't work. And the important qualitative point to understand is they're actually very simple. Diffeomorphisms, or if you like, infinitesimal diffeomorphisms, which are given by the Lie algebra of the diffeomorphism group, this is the set of vector fields, as we know very well. But when you have a boundary, a surface with boundary, the vector fields must be tangent to the boundary on the boundary. In other words, the diffeomorphisms must map the boundary onto the boundary. That's crucial. In the gauge theoretic formulation, you don't have any analog of these constraints. And that makes all the, all the difference. It's like in the, gauge theory, the usual gauge theory formulation, you would allow diffeomorphism that move the boundary. But then clearly, if you're on the disk, you can shrink the disk to a point if you like. There's nothing that will, that will happen. But so th so th that's this subtle constraint that, 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 that makes all the difference. So how can you deal with that? So it's, it's clear the intuition now it should be clear. The gauge grouping, the gauge reformulation is just too big to be consistent with the gravitational description, with the gravitational interpretation. One way that people have discussed in the literature, and I mentioned it also paper by Iliezu, Pufu, Verlinde, and Wang, where they try to address this, that question, but only approximately, is okay, you say, we need to introduce degrees of freedom on the boundary. And the people tr have tried to do that by hand. So one way to do that by hand, the most naive way, is to say, okay, let's add a boundary term. So this is an A. Let's add a boundary term 
that breaks explicitly the PSL2R on the boundary with some boundary conditions that relate the gauge field to this D. That's a very standard setup. Uh, with this boundary condition, this boundary term here in the action makes the variational principle consistent. You can check that easily. And at the end of the day, this model, you work it out easily, you uh, go to a model uh, that describes particles on the group PSL2R. So there is no indeed boundary degrees of freedom. These boundary degrees of freedom describe particles on the group, so loops on the groups. So it's, it's a, the, the, the space over which you integrate is just the loop space of PSL2R. But that's not, of course, Jackie Teitelbaum. It has nothing to do with Jackie Teitelbaum. It cannot be Jackie Teitelbaum for several reasons. Uh, well, it doesn't give you the right action, right degrees of freedom, etc. But it's obvious it cannot work because this sort of boundary conditions, for example, explicitly breaks the reparametrization invariance on the boundary. And of course, in the gravitational model, you need to have reparametrization invariance on, of your loops if your loops are the boundary. So that's not what you have in models like that. So that doesn't work. So what uh, uh, I did in, my, in this paper is to solve that problem completely. And I think very precisely and rigorously formulating the correct PSL2R formulation of, of the models. The result is that you can have actually for each boundary component, four different types of boundary conditions that work. So you classify all the possibilities and you get four, if you like four models or four types of boundary conditions. One of these, of course, unfortunately, corresponds to the JT gravity that we discussed. But you also have three other possibilities. The strategy that I used and then implemented like by brute force is really to focus on implementing the correct gauge symmetries. That's all what you have to do. No, don't try to have préjugé. Just do it you know, from scratch, from what you know should be true. And what should be true? Well, one gauge symmetry that should be preserved is what I call PSL2RD. These are just the gauge transformations, the PSL2R gauge transformations that go to U1 gauge transformations on the boundary. I don't want to restrict to transformations that go to the identity on the boundary, which would be essentially what people do when they do this. No, because the U1 in PSL2R are local frame rotations and I can still do local frame rotations on the boundary. So I want to keep the U1 gauge symmetry including at the boundary. But I don't want to keep the other two generators on the boundary, okay? Those would correspond to, uh, as I said, diffeomorphism for which the constraint that the tangent, that the generators must be tangent to the boundary are not respected. So I, I have to get rid of those. But the U1, I want to keep, okay? So this accounts, so this piece in the gauge symmetry will account for all the DFOs that restricts to the identity on the boundary and also for the local frame rotations, all the local frame rotations. Of course, if I do that, I miss the reparametrization of the boundary. So I have to add that on top. I also have to add that the model should be invariant and their boundary reparametrization, so div plus of S1, okay? And then let's try to build the most general PSL2R gauge theory that is boundary reparametrization uh, re re invariant and has this PSL2R D gauge symmetry. And then you work and all the details are in the paper and you find the following. So the action is, okay, you have the bulk, the usual bulk term, and then you have four possible consistent boundary terms that you can add with associated boundary conditions. The first case is actually a case where you do not need to add any boundary term. So you don't have any boundary term, but then the boundary condition that you impose is to fix the length and to fix the extrinsic curvature of the boundary. Okay, so for each boundary, you get two parameters. L and K, the length and the extrinsic curvature. 
Of course, when k equal to zero, you find this, the usual topological Mirzakhani pictures of geodesics matter. Geodesics are just the curves with k equals zero. But it's natural and possible to consider this more general setup where you fix just the extrinsic curvature. As it turns out, within this case, you get three qualitatively distinct behaviors depending on whether k in absolute value is strictly less than one, strictly greater than one, or strictly less than minus one. And you also have the limiting cases that you can also have k equal one and k equal minus one. But you really have three different quali qualitatively different cases. So that's one type of boundary condition. Second type of boundary conditions, you have to add this boundary term. So the integral of this omega, the spin connection, minus omega bar. I have to explain what omega bar is quickly. But just to say, you do that and you fix this parameter phi, which is the phi in JT, and also the length of the boundary. Okay, so you fix those two guys and you add this. It works. And that's reproducing precisely the JT gravity model. So we're happy we found it because maybe that's the most interesting boundary condition you want to consider eventually. The omega bar here is, is a subtlety that enters because we're in this gauge theory formulation. So on the disk, let, let me give you the definition on the disk because there it's very simple. It's just d alpha, where alpha is the angle between the unit tangent vector to the boundary and a fixed direction in the disk, which, which since the, you know, the disk, of course, you know, the tangent bundle is trivial. So you, you can trivialize it. So you have fixed directions and then you, have, you can define this global angle. And this is how you define omega bar. In more general terms, this omega bar is, is what is called the framing of the boundary. So it gives you a direction with respect to which you compute angles. And when you subtract omega with omega bar, you get a gauge invariant, a U1 invariant object. That's what is important because under a local frame rotation, omega will change by the corresponding D theta, if theta is the angle of the local frame rotation, but this alpha also will change by the same amount. And so this gives a U1 invariant um, uh, quantity. So the framing in general is given because you impose that you have a length element on the boundary. So you have a direction, you have this tangent vector. So that's explained uh, completely in the paper. It's a bit technical. I don't know. Maybe you get what you already understood what I meant. If not, look at the paper. And it's, an, it's a subtle but important point, but it works very well. And this is how you define it. This is JT gravity. So you have the correct parameters. And remarkably, you can check that this guy reduces to the integral of the extrinsic curvature. You know, when you express your gauge theory variables in terms of your, of the metric, this is exactly, it turns out that this is precisely the integral of the extrinsic curvature. So you reproduce exactly JT. That's very nice, that works. Then you have two other cases. The, the, the third case, you have this boundary term and the, this vector field chi, you impose that it's proportional to the unit tangent on the boundary. And you also fix, this is a bit interesting, you also fix now no longer the extrinsic curvature, you fix the integrated extrinsic curvature along the boundary. Okay, so that's a rather interesting, completely new set of boundary conditions that you can consider. This lambda here in the gravity formulation is the same as the normal derivative of the dilaton field. So it's like you have Newman boundary conditions now for phi. Whereas in ordinary JT, you have Dirichlet boundary conditions for phi. And this parameter, this integrated um, extrinsic curvature, if you consider the simplest model, which is the disk, then this is just the area of the disk. So if you like, it's a model where you fix the area, but not the length of the boundary. You fix the area of your disk, but not the length. Okay, whereas in ordinary JT, you fix the length, but not the area. That's funny, and that's consistent, and 
it exists. And finally, you have uh, the, the, the last case is essentially the Legendre transform of JT, where you have the parameters phi and lambda. So Sorry, lambda is again this new. Frank, uh, is it is it, is it uh, the area irrespective of the immersion? Right. You're not. In, you're, you don't need it to be an embedding. For no. That. Okay. No. That's a good point. So th this works for immersion. Actually, you could characterize immersion by the fact that this formula works, that the integral of the extrinsic curvature yields the area of some disk. That works precisely for immersions. If it's not for immersions, it's no longer working. Like for the eight I was drawing, that's one way actually to understand that the eight cannot work. So that's a good, uh, good, uh, good remark. Right. So this last case, it's just fixing phi and lambda. It's a Legendre transform because the boundary reaction is just the usual JT term plus lambda L over eight pi. So it's lambda is, is here like a cosmological constant on the boundary. L is not fixed, but lambda is fixed. If you do the Legendre transform, you can go to L fixed, you know, uh, and go back to to JT gravity. So. In JT gravity, fixing L is like fixing the temperature. So it's like being in a canonical ensemble. Here you do the Legendre transform. So this is like going to the micro canonical ensemble, if you want, putting this boundary condition. So it's not something genuinely new. It's, uh... Okay, so that's what you get. And now, okay, I have a couple of slides on just discussing the first class of boundary conditions that generalizes Mirzakhani, if you like, because this is actually a, a, a new uh, a sort of topology, if you want, topological gravity that goes beyond Mirzakhani, which I think mathematically is extremely interesting to, to consider. So if you give me five more minutes, I can give you a very short account of, give you the flavor of what's associated with this new uh, uh, possibility of considering fixed extrinsic curvature on boundaries, uh, uh, whereas- yeah, please, yeah. Go ahead. please go ahead. You want that or? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Let's yeah. go fast. So the usual topological gravity is geodesics boundary. So K equals zero. Now I want to consider K equal constant. And the claim is that you have three different behaviors. If K is strictly between minus one and one, it turns out rather beautifully that you can show that the partition function does not depend on L and K independently, but only on this combination, L square root of one minus K squared. I call that parameter L bar, this invariant parameter L bar. And the intuition is as follows. When you have a boundary uh, uh, satisfying this constraint, essentially the geometry near the boundary looks like what is called a funnel, we, where you have essentially, let's say the boundary is here, but you always have this funnel. So you could, you know, cut your surface or possibly add pieces in order to move the boundary along the funnel. And now on the funnel, you have always a special curve, which is a geodesics. The length, of course, of this geodesics will be this L bar, you know. And you can check that the length and extrinsic curvatures of all these boundaries are such that, of course, this combination is always constant. Otherwise, the claim here would not make sense. So that's quite nice. So it tells you, though, okay, that picking K between minus one and one doesn't give you more really than k equals zero. Well, it's, it's a bit funny, you have to understand that, but eventually it's not a, ge a genuine generalization, okay? So k between minus one and one, you could say, okay, I can always cut or add a little bit, a little piece in my funnel so that I'm going back to Mirzahani and, and to the geodesic boundaries. If k is strictly less than minus one, well, that's interesting. k is strictly less than minus one, then you can show that the partition function depends also only on this invariant parameter here. I call that two pi alpha. And it turns out that the geometry near the boundary is always like this. So you always have a boundary here and that's a piece, the geometry extends here. 
So this piece locally embed in the hyperbolic plane, but not the normal hyperbolic plane. It can be a hyperbolic plane for which the periodicity here is not two pi, but is actually two pi alpha, okay? So you just take the usual matrix on the hyperbolic plane, but your phi variable, instead of, say, of stating that it goes from zero to two pi, you say, no, it can go from zero to two pi alpha. That's perfectly okay since you, the boundary is here. So you, you don't go to zero, so you don't have any problem and, and you can do that. That's a smooth geometry. So that's what the geometry looks like near a K less than minus one boundary. Now, since I claim that the partition function depends only on this combination of parameters, you can always assume without changing the partition function that you want to compute, that you close this circle here to a point. And then of course, you create a conical singularity. So the boundary condition with this in this case allows you, or uh, if you like, is actually what allows you to take into account the insertion of conical singularities of arbitrary angle two pi alpha on your Riemann surface. That's a load and that's very natural here. Very interestingly, this was considered by Witten through the summer. So there's a paper by Witten through the summer where he considered generalizations of JT and that's exactly this, you know, introducing conical. So he get the conical singularities by considering a potential for the dilaton and he has a nice discussion along these lines. Here, it's just a special case of my general construction. So it's nice to see that it, it's included in the construction. Last case is K greater than one. This turns out to be the most difficult case to understand. Having boundaries with K strictly greater than one turns out to put very strong constraints on the possible geometries. I don't have time to explain here. It's a bit technical. It's nice geometry, but it's a bit technical. But let me just give you one instance so that you really understand how, how it works. One result, which is easy to understand. Assume that you have a Riemann surface with B boundaries and assume that you impose that on all the B boundaries, the extrinsic curvature is fixed to a number which is strictly greater than one then you can show that this is possible only if the genus is zero and you have only one boundary. In other words, it's only possible for the disk. Quite strong. Okay, so only the disk has, boundar has, has boundaries uh, for which K is strictly greater than one on all boundaries. Okay, so that just gives you a flavor that having this puts strong constraints on possible geometries. Uh, another thing that you can prove is that the interesting geometry is having this sort of, of a boundary of boundaries must also include cones of, the, of angle strictly greater than two pi. Strictly greater than two pi. So if you're interested how this comes about, uh, look at the paper, you have the detail there. So let me finish by that. We have, okay, developed this gauge theory construction with many goals and, and, and the, the genuine goals were emphasized at the beginning of the talk. But we also find in this construction very interesting generalizations of topological gravity that I described here, like a partition function that not only depends on the length of the geodesics, so you can have geodesics boundaries, but you can also add codes and also these alpha tilts, so these guys. Can we generalize Mirzakhani to eventually compute this, so including cones on, this, on these guys? What is at stake here? I think it's a non-trivial generalization of Mirzakhani. It's really a non-trivial generalization. Uh, for instance, when you have cones, and that's explained in, in the Widen's paper uh, of the summer, if you have codes of angles greater than pi, not two pi, pi is enough, then you can show that you don't no longer have a pair of pounds decomposition of your surface. So that just gives you a flavor that having these conical, just the conical singularities is already non-trivial. If you have the 
These guys, it implies that you have cones with angles actually greater than two pi. And that makes the story even more complicated. Okay, that's a, an interesting mathematical question. Of course, what I'm working now is the quantum path integral, the measure, how do, do this construction of the gauge theory uh, can be used to define the measure. And that would be another talk. I have already, uh, I, I think I'm almost done to write a paper, but, but that would be another talk. So I think I can really stop now. And thank you for hearing me for such a long time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's open to questions. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, maybe, maybe, yes, Jan um, I was wondering what would happen if we impose the area preserving diffeomorphism uh, in your hyperbolic uh, space? I mean, uh, I mean, it should be a subclass of the models or something uh, non trivial would happen by imposing uh, the unimodularity of the metric. So, this uh, is a good question, and I do not know. Maybe, you know, that's a good question. Can we find, for example, a gauge theory version for that? I, 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 I must admit, I, I, I know that this sort of, of models can be interested in particular, interesting in particular in two dimensions, but I admit I didn't think about it. But I think that's a good question. I'm, I'm asking because there is a very special point about uh, uh, the possibility to have a quantum all effect on hyperbolic plane. So that's, you know, by imposed, by having an external strong magnetic field, one would get naturally this uh, area preserving this, uh, or W infinity algebra, let's say, in a more quantum way. So I was wondering if something would happen interesting. But... So I, I cannot answer, but I just feel that this is a good question. Okay. <laughs> but uh, okay. <laughs> I have no, you know, I, I cannot give you an answer. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Maybe I can ask one. I expected to hear maybe a little bit on SYK mm -hmm. models. Can you say where they fit into? Of course. Into, uh, of course. So, okay. So the SYK or the tensors are supposed to be versions of the holographic duals of these models, okay? So they are supposed, uh, where is it? Yeah, they are supposed to give you this guy. Exactly, exactly yes. Okay. So why yeah, is if, that so? If I remember correctly, Witten points out this argument with regard to the uh, delta, the, uh, yeah. So, what, so, and so why is that so? Yeah. So the, the reason is that in the jet in the in the SYK or related models, the low energy physics is governed by a set of Schwinger Dyson equations that you derive from the properties of the large end limit of the models that has the reparametrization invariance. Okay, so the Schwinger Dyson equation, which is usually it's an integral, uh, differential integral formula, if you like. In, in the low energy limit of the models, it, it is reparametrization invariant, which means that you uh, uh, can, uh, if you like, study the low energy excitations by looking at the dynamics of the reparametrization modes. In the strict low energy limit, it's reparametrization invariant, but of course, you have small deviations to that. So the light fields are governed by the first small deviation to the reparametrization invariance, and you can uh, uh, try to work with this. When you do this, you can argue, not prove, I emphasize that, it's not been proven, but you can argue that the light modes are actually governed by the Schwarzian action. The idea is always related to, to the fact that you need to have some PSL2R symmetry eventually. And you know, and the, the, the Schwarzschild derivative is the guy which is PSL2R invariant. And, and, and so it's not surprising that it actually enters into this game. So the claim is that the, this low energy modes in SYK or tensor models are described by an action which is the Schwarzschild. 
And I think, of course, this came actually before the developments related to JT gravity that I have been describing today. So I think this is the reason why people uh, jumped so quickly on this reparametrization ansatz here. Because they had in mind that something like that could describe the physics. And indeed, you know, as I explained, if you restrict yourself to these configurations, you get the Schwarzschild action, which is okay. Now, why do I think this might eventually be all consistent? For, for two reasons. First of all, you might imagine that the subtleties I've been talking about here, this UV microstructure, should not be relevant at low energies, okay? So exactly as in SYK, at low energy, you want to smooth that out. In SYK, it's very explicit how you, you get it. To get the Schwarzschild in SYK, you consider reparametrization, but of course, that, that are expanding in Fourier modes, but with a cutoff in the frequencies. If the reparametrization can have arbitrary frequencies, then you probing the UV properties of the model, and that's not going to be described by the Schwarzschild anyway, okay? So uh, an arbitrary reparametrization in SYK is actually not described by the Schwarzschild. These are just reparametrization which are smooth enough with a cutoff in, in their Fourier modes that corresponds to the cutoff below which the low energy description is valid. So maybe this is just equivalent to here smoothing that out. And on the other hand, the puzzle here came about. So now you know, okay, so this is the relation with SYK, okay? This, and then you get the Schwarzschild. Now, at first, people didn't see any puzzle. People were happy. Oh, we're getting a Schwarzschild. We are starting to have a full holographic description where you, you, we can handle both the gravitational side and the, and the quantum mechanical side, okay? That, that's the, that was the excitement about it. On the quantum mechanical side, you have SYK, we get a Schwarzschild. No, on the gravitational side, we have these two-dimensional models, and we also get a Schwarzschild action. Perfect. And nobody was unhappy by this one loop result. People started to get nervous when people realized that this was not one loop, that this was exact. If you believe that this is the correct manifold over which we integrate. And then you do the wisdom at Ekman. So this is supposed not to be exact. And that can't work. It's not large N or low energy here. It's supposed to be exact. And, and, and that's where the puzzle you know, enters. But so maybe, you know, so one of, of the suggestions, not certainly a proof, not even a claim, but the suggestion I have is that maybe there is no puzzle. And that if, and that all the complications about the discreteness of the, of the, of the spectrum, you know, the fact that we should get something like this might be related to the fact that we have to integrate over all these nasty features and actually deal with this complicated combinatorial problem of considering, you know, all these immersions might be. Okay, so that's where the relation with is, is and, and yes, so, you know, SYK tensor models came before that and are supposed to be, again, versions of the holographic duals of JT gravity theories. Of course, JT gravity, you can decorate it. Today, I discussed the most basic, mo the, the, you know, the basic model. You, you can decorate it, you can make it supersymmetric, you can add matter fields, you know, you can couple it to conformal matter, et cetera. You, you have decorations. And, and these decorations should correspond to different uh, holographic duals. But if you, you always have this sort of exact result that, that come with this, which means that the holographic dual cannot be a unique quantum theory at, if you believe that. So if you neglect, <laughs> again, this. And the interpretation that is favored at the moment 
uh, in the literature is this interpretation by Satz, Schenker, and Stanford, which abandon the idea that, that you have a genuine quantum mechanical model, but that you have instead an ensemble of quantum mechanical models. And that's a consistent, and of course, this is yielding this very interesting matrix model also, interpretation, et cetera. Okay, so, so that's fine. But, uh, you know, so the lesson from my talk is that I think the disk partition function has not been understood properly. It's an extremely difficult problem. And we should really work on this because this model is more than a toy model somehow, you know. Uh, just to, to put it plainly, imagine we can do this, Sun, taking into account all these properties, and we find the discrete spectrum. You know, we compute the Z and the row here is, is, is a guy like this. This means that we've solved the, for the first time, probably a genuinely quantum mechanical theory of gravity. You know, if, if this would happen, I think for the first time we could claim we've done a fully quantum gravitational theory and we've solved it. So I think you know, there's something there. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a super toy model. <laughs> Can I ask? Other, other people are wanting to question. No, no, go ahead. Bob. The first ahead. thing I want to know is the following. You are focusing on computing the partition function or the action, but they, they are states on some algebra. And the natural algebra I can think of are functions on the boundary and their conjugate momenta. Okay? And you can make them into a while algebra. The question I am, suppose you compute the, not the partition function alone, but the actual correlators at the boundary. What uh, first question is, then the correlators define a state with regard to this algebra. And the question is, is that state cyclic and separating? Because if it is, then it is thermal and there is a modular Hamiltonian. You know, so you, you are asking the right question, but I cannot, ob I obviously I cannot answer. You know, I, I still don't understand fully the computation of the partition function. But of course, you sh one should do what you're saying. You know, these correlators in the usual setup like this, you can set that up, okay? It's, it's not too complicated to do. And so you have a, a Schwarzian description of these correlators. You have several papers uh, in the literature that study this, but these are not going to answer or or be consistent with what you want, because again, this is not quantum mechanics. No, but it need not be. If I know the correlators and whether with regard to that algebra, which I think is the Weyl algebra, the state you are finding is cyclic and separating. Then one of the issues were, was, is there a modular Hamiltonian? By, by Tomita Takesaki, you know there is. Yeah. So you would have a modular <laughs> Hamiltonian or so, so, my, so I think that in that framework, what you will not have what you say, that's not going to work. But maybe if you do it properly, as I try to suggest, you would get what you say. But to, to go there, I, I want, you know, first you have to understand, I think, the partition function, that's the basic building block. My expectation is that if you do, the next step would be exactly to consider the correlators and analyze them very precisely along the lines that you're suggesting. And that, if you can do that eventually, then you, you can claim that you've understood completely the okay. world. But okay. I agree, full understanding requires to have these states. And if you want to describe that in terms of this algebra with these uh, properties associated with finite temperature, Yes, that, that would be the fully rigorous, nice way to proceed. So the second related question is, so that, the reason I said that is that we think the state is cyclic and separating, it is necessarily KMS. So mm -hmm. it is a partition function for some KMS uh, Hamiltonian, KMS model, but modular Hamiltonian, but in, no, never mind. What you want is not actually factorization, no, uh, physically. You want cluster decomposition. Mm -hmm. So the issue will be if I don't know exactly how to tell the distance between two 
circles at the boundaries. Okay? Yes, that's a difficult but, one. Huh? I don't know what is a metric. So, to, but what one wants is not the factorization, but one wants uh, cluster decomposition. So, I don't know how to formulate it. Uh, just a remark. Okay? Uh, but I don't know what is the meaning of saying that the two circles are far apart. I don't know what it means okay? in this context. So, uh, just a remark. So, okay. by the way, the talk was excellent, very provocative. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, very good. Uh, last question is you were worrying about boundaries which were, um, not, uh, which were Jordan curves, quite general Jordan curves. Okay? Uh, there is a, in the book of Alain Cohn the, on um, algebraic, uh, this uh, uh, non commutative geometry, there is a section on a disk with the boundary, which is a continuous curve, but nowhere differentiable. Okay? So he is considering a Julia set, for example. Okay? So mm -hmm. he is considering explicitly a disk with a boundary, which is uh, nowhere differentiable, but it is continuous. Okay? Then in that case, he is able to define this uh, cyclic homology and actually find, let us say, he is able to do a full calculation on, for example, the fractal dimension or the boundary. Okay, and mm -hmm. he gets the uh, using again geometrical uh, this algebraic ideas, and he gets an answer which is compatible with what uh, other people in uh, say Mandelbrot and so on get for a, such a curve, a Julia set at the boundary. Okay, so I was wondering whether or it, this remark may be useful in your context because he writes everything out completely. And the uh, degrees of freedom that we are, we are talking about lives at the boundary alone okay? in this calculation. Just a remark, but uh, I don't know if it is relevant for you. Uh, I yeah. thought that will be applicable nicely to quantum Hall effects, okay? because uh, one can prepare samples, experimental samples, but the boundaries are not nicely smooth. Okay? At least approximate them. And one would have something to say about them. I have yeah, no, okay. no. Okay, I registered what you say. I have to look. I looked into Alain books, but that was when I was very young. <laughs> I have to. I have to yeah. Yeah, I mean, refresh my memory. This idea keeps coming to my head once in a while, but one has to sit and do the. Well, it is a very physical application. Quantum gravity is still completely remote from experiments. But the quantum Hall effect has an experimental uh, uh, significance. And one can imagine preparing a, sap, a disk with a boundary which is not smooth. Okay? And mm -hmm. Checking what happens for the boundary excitations of the quantum Hall effect. Okay? This can be done from his work, but I somehow... Okay. Uh, actually, you know, I, have, I have a friend, Semyon Kleftsov, I don't know if you know him, who is actually working, he has been working on the boson... He was one of my collaborators on these old papers in two-dimensional gravity and, and he's working on the quantum hole effect. So I, I, I should actually talk with him. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. so thank you. Thank you but about you also said that there are Jordan curves which are bounding uh, topologically different disks. Okay. And you said you'll draw graphs. Yes, we, yeah. yes, you're oh, going yes. to come back and show us that one. We, Charles has gone, but we uh, will keep it in the recording if you can. Show okay, that. okay, so I'm going to show you this. Okay, so wait a second. So I have to first find it in my list of uh, papers, and then I will share. It's, it's, I'm going to find it quickly because it's somewhere here. Wait a second. Uh, all right. Uh, immersions. Uh, here it is. I think. Wait. I have so many references. <laughs> that, okay. I have the book back here, but that's not what you want. Uh, here it is. Great. Wait, I have to bring it here. Okay. Yes, here it is. All right. So I have to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Or oh, how do you do that? Stop share. And then share again. 
Maybe that's yes. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. yes? So. Okay. So let, let me just give you a very quick overview so that you will understand the picture. So you see here, so he, 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 the example is uh, depicted in, in a very simple uh, way using some discretized version of the, of the, of the business. So here, it, it, so it, the idea is that you're describing the boundary curve by a set of moves that, that he calls left and right, okay? So left, you go left, right, you go right, left, right, etc. So it's clear that if you're given the sequence of L's and R's, that codes completely the boundary, okay? Because each time you're going to add uh, uh, this line, a line element of given length, and if I go left, it's yeah. a fixed angle, right, a fixed angle, etc. Sure. Okay. okay. So you Get understand? Picture, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so eventually uh, uh, hexagons are just put together in this construction. So here you have an example for an embedding. Mm -hmm. okay, so you have an embedding, this is the boundary curve and inside you have the embedded disk, no problem. Okay. Now here is the crazy example, crazy example. So you have these two pictures on the left and on the right. What he did was to stretch so, some hexagons but in principle, they shouldn't be stretched. But if you don't stretch them, then because these are immersions, some pieces will go on top of the other pieces. And so the drawing will become hard to read. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the trick he has, which is very nice, uh, that allows to actually depict these bizarre immersions in a way that you can actually visualize. All right. But now, of course, the boundary is uh, uh, completely coded, as we said, by these moves, success, uh, sequences, sequence of left and right, okay? Mm -hmm. So if I start from A, I will have a left, then uh, right. wait, 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 so A, because, so this is here, the boundary, what you call the boundary mm -hmm. code. So uh, wait, uh, he moves counterclockwise, okay. So he starts here from A, and then he say, probably this is left, then left, right, left, right, left, left, right, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, so that works. So you can check this wall string here, code completely the boundary. Mm -hmm. Now you have to check that the very same code applies to the boundary for the drawing on the right. So those two boundaries are actually the same on the left and on the right. What is different is the stretching that he has done. But you can check it. You, know, you, you have to do it okay. carefully. If you like, uh, okay, uh, well, you'll have uh, the recordings. So, okay, you have this picture, but you can look at the reference. Okay, so this reference is this. Uh, I mentioned it yeah, also in my, nice, yeah. mm -hmm. my the Graver Cargo uh, uh, review, which is uh, quite nice. Okay, so you can check, it works. Trust me, I checked it three times because I, I couldn't believe <laughs> it could work, but it does work. So these are really the same boundaries, but clearly the immersed disks are not the same because you can check that this, for example, this region here where he, he put it mm -hmm. dotted in, uh, dots inside the hexagons, this region doesn't have any analog. It doesn't fit in here. Okay. So they're not, they're different <laughs> immersions, but they're bounded by the same curve. So okay. confusing. Very nice, very nice, okay. And the like a reflection, no? there is a combinatorial recipe that tells you for a given boundary, first of all, if or if not, it is the boundary of an immersed disk. And if it is, how many disks you have how many distinct disks you have, right? But so he, that's, he had that's, a bounce that's, that's, observation that they, uh, the way that they are drawn, they are reflections, they're mirrors of one another. Is there a yeah. symmetry that maps? Uh, I know, no, 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 they are not reflections. Oh, they're not okay. They're not. I see, yes, no, no, they are not. They ah. look like it. If I no, they, they, no, they no, do, look, but there's a little gap this there. This that piece that here, region is not, is not there. quite the same. No, no. So if they were reflections, that wouldn't count, okay? 
Huh? Because okay. the, the, the claim is that the, the, the immersions are distinct in the, in the sense that you don't have any diffeomorphism of the disk that maps one to another. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they are genuinely distinct. It's okay. amazing. <laughs> okay. So in the Bourbaki seminar, <laughs> you have the proofs. Of that. Okay. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much. Right. I will stop the recording because it's probably getting Thanks rather loud at this point. Yeah. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, thank you. I am called Bal. I have we have not met, but I was yes. curious. You are obviously French, not Italian. Right. I am. I am French. Welcome. Your name is Italian, Ferrari. That's yeah. right. That's right. I, I'm, you know, I'm from the southeast of France uh, in the Nice area. Ah, I see. I so it's, it's quite near the border. Ah, but, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right.